I hear some good fellowship. That's good. Please stand with us. We get ready to worship the, the one and only God who's worthy of our praise. We're going to lift our voices, our instruments. Even if I ran away, your love never fades. I know I still make mistakes, but you have the mercies for me every day. Your love never fades. Yeah. Sing it out, you stay the same. You stay the same through the eggy days. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Cause I know that you love me Your love never fades Your love never fades The wind is strong and the water is deep I'm not alone here in these open seas Your love never fades yeah. Oh yeah The chasm is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side Your love never fades You stay the same Come on church, sing it out Stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love me. Your love never fails Your love never fails We sing this promise from Scripture You make all things work together for my good You make all things Work together for my good. We keep singing that you made all things work together for my good. You made all things work together for my good. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the ocean rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fades Your love never fails oh, yeah. We've got a new series that is going to be starting 
in about 14 minutes. And um, I mean, I'm excited about this series. It is called Setting a Course, Principles on Parenting. And I know some of you are like, man, that's so far behind me in my life or that's so far in front of me. But it's just so important, especially we have so many families with, with kids. And so we're going to dive into some things today that I think will be really helpful. I hope and pray that they are. And uh, I'll talk to you certainly a whole lot more about the series, the whys, where it came from. I did just want to say this, though. I, I want to kind of give credit to Hannah Mobley. She's the one who planted the seed in my mind that made me want to take this picture for this series. Because our kids' programming in the back on Sunday mornings for preschool and elementary is called Compass Kids. Compass Kids. It's about making sure kids are moving in the right direction. That's certainly our prayer, and it's the prayer of every parent who cares about their child. And so that image just kind of sets the sets up the idea from Compass Kids. And so I just wanted to kind of put a, uh, a plug in there for what they're doing. We'll certainly talk more about their ministry in the coming weeks. But, uh, but let's pray right now, and then we'll continue with our worship. God, we love you. We just thank you for today. We thank you for the privilege, Lord, of gathering in your name. I pray that our hearts and minds would be open today. God, I pray that no matter where we are in the process of family, whether we are kind of here on our own, whether we've got kids, grandkids, whether we just have an opportunity maybe to influence the neighbor's kids or kids here at church, we, we all want to see the next generation succeed. We want to see the next generation grow to, and, and to love you, Lord Jesus. And so we pray for wisdom to know how to help that happen. Speak to us today, we ask. I, I pray for your church around the world as your light is shining. And as we live in the reality of Easter that Jesus came back to life as we celebrated last week, it's a reminder, God, that you are overall, that you give us hope and peace and blessing through Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. <laughs> I'm Maddie Ross, daughter of Frank Ross. Oh, <laughs> tragic thing. May I say your father impressed me with his manly qualities. He was a close trader, but he acted the gentleman. Well, I propose to sell those ponies back to you that my father bought. Oh, that I fear is out of the question. I will see that they're shipped to you at my earliest convenience. Well, we don't want the ponies now. We don't need them. Well, that hardly concerns me. Your father bought the ponies and paid for them, and there's an end of it. I, I have the bill of sale. And I want $300 for Papa's saddle horse that was stolen from your stable. You have to take that up with a man who stole a horse. Tom Cheney stole the horse while it was in your care. You are responsible. <laughs> yeah, I admire your sand. But I believe you will find I'm not liable for such claims. You were the custodian. If you were a bank ever robbed, you could not simply tell the depositors to go hang. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Secondly, your valuation of the horse is high by about $200. How old are if you? If anything, my price is low. My Judy is a fine racing mare. I've seen her jump an eight rail fence with the heavy rider. I'm 14. Oh, well, it's all very interesting. The ponies are yours. Take them. Your father's horse was stolen by a murderous criminal. I had provided reasonable protection for the creature as per our implicit agreement. My watchman had his teeth knocked out and can take only soup. Well, I will take it to law. You have no case. Lawyer J. Noble Daggett of Dardanelle, Arkansas, may think otherwise. Is my to jury. Petitioned by a widow and three small children. I will pay $200 to your father's estate when I have in my hand a letter from your lawyer absolving me of all liability from the beginning of the world to date. I will date take now. $200 for Judy plus $100 for the ponies and $25 for the gray horse that Tom Cheney left. He was easily worth $40. Right, that is $325 total. The ponies have no part in it. I will not buy them. And the price for Judy is $325. Uh, I would not pay $325 for winged Pegasus. As for the gray horse, it does not belong to you. The gray horse was lent to Tom Cheney by my father. Cheney only had the use of him. I will pay $225 and keep the gray horse. I don't want the ponies. I cannot accept that. There will be no settlement after I leave this office. It will go to law. All right, this is my last offer. $250 for that. I get the release previously discussed, and I keep your father's saddle. 
The gray horse is not yours to sell. The saddle is not for sale. I will keep it. Gloria Daggett will prove ownership of the gray horse. He will come after you with a writ of replevin. A what? Writ of All right, now, let, but listen very carefully, as I will not bargain further. I will take the ponies back and the gray horse, which is mine, and settle for $300. Now, you must take that or leave it, and I do not much care which it is. Well, Lawyer Daggett would not wish me to consider anything under $325. But I will settle for 320 if I am given the 20 in advance. Now, here's what I have to say about that saddle. I love that clip from the remake of the old movie True Grit. 14-year-old Maddie Ross negotiates a settlement with a horse trader who quickly realizes that he is in over his head. And I wonder if you've ever been in a conversation, in a disagreement, or a debate with a teenager when you suddenly realized that you were in over your head. Or maybe, maybe it wasn't a teenager, maybe it was a fifth grader, or a first grader, or a toddler. I can remember coming home from, from work and Gail kind of meeting me at the door saying, I can't reason with him. He's only, I don't know, 10 years old, 7 years old, 5 years old. She said he can already out-debate me. I mean, maybe you can relate to that. As parents, you've been there. You know, you have a pretty good idea of what's right, what's best, what needs to be done. And so you explain it clearly to your child who is standing right in front of you. And for some reason, the distance between what comes out of your mouth and goes into their ears, into their brain, or what gets done, seems like it must be a thousand miles away. Or maybe you make your intentions and expectations known, and they have a thousand reasons why their intentions are better than yours. We're beginning a new series today that's called Setting a Course, Principles on Parenting. A friend of mine asked me if it should be called Setting the Course, but that sounded to me like there was only one course, and I was afraid you might come here expecting that I was going to tell you what that course was and that you would have a clear path to success. I am not dumb enough to make a promise like that. Think about Adam and Eve. They are the only people in history who had perfect parents, and they still blew it. Okay, I can't tell you the course. I thought about calling this series Charting a Course, but that still felt like a very specific plan. Notice in this picture that I took for the series, he is not holding a GPS, he is holding a compass. Okay, a compass kind of sends you in the right direction. If you're expecting a GPS that says turn left in 300 feet, turn right at the stop sign, proceed four miles on you know, Highway 4, well, it just doesn't work that way, does it? You follow those, you know, you'd like to be able to follow a set of instructions and out come healthy and mature adults. It's just not that simple. Let me say a few things about this series before we really dive in. I am not a parenting expert, okay? Gail and I raised three kids who are responsible, hardworking, mature adults, praise God. But I'm telling you, much of their success is in spite of us, not because of us, Okay? We will not be inviting them here for a Q&A for you to find out how we did as parents, okay? They are banished during this series, all right? We did some things right. We did some things wrong. Gail was better at this than I was, especially when the kids were young. God's grace extends to our parenting as well as to our sins and failures, thank God. Now, here's another thing. This series is not about beating you up for all the things that you may have done wrong as a parent. I mean, seriously, if parenting is largely in the rearview mirror for you and you're afraid that all I'm going to do is pile guilt on you for all the things you should have done differently, just know that I'm the one saying this stuff and I'm really uncomfortable about it because I think about all the things I wish I had done differently. So I, so I get it. My, my goal is not to make you feel bad, but we're kind of all in this together. And if you just absolutely feel like this series has nothing to do with your life, man, I believe that much of what we're going to talk about impacts grandparents, children of parents, anybody who has the opportunity to pour into the life of a child. And, and if you still think, well, still, that's just, just not where I am at all, then as a compassionate member of our church family, 
I'm asking that you accept the fact that not everything is about you. All right, I mean, sometimes we have to let the focus be on somebody else. Love you. I'm just saying there's a lot of people who I think really need this right now. Back in the early 90s, Gail and I went to a seminar on parenting by Gary and Anne Marie Ezzo. We did not agree with everything that they taught. In fact, they became more and more controversial in the years after we heard them. But they suggested in that series that there are four primary stages of child rearing and the different ways that parents should handle those stages. The preschool years, kind of the two years old to five years old, are primarily the discipline stage. During that time, parents establish authority and help kids learn right from wrong. From ages 6 to 12, parents are typically in the training stage. They're walking along with their kids. They're showing them through example how to make decisions, how to relate to people, how to handle conflict and anger, joy and disappointment. The teen years bring the coaching stage. When it comes to to sports, many teams train for months, but once the season starts, the coach cannot just walk out onto the field or walk out onto the court during a game and say, let's run that again. Okay, It doesn't work that way. He, He or she has to call in plays from the sidelines. And once kids hit the teen years, parenting happens largely from the sidelines. Don't get me wrong, we're still deeply involved in our kids' lives, but we don't spend every moment with them as they grow older. We have to release them gradually and then trust that they're going to learn to make decisions on their own. And then once our children are in their 20s and beyond, we're in the friendship stage, what I like to think of as the the legacy stage. We, We get to watch them demonstrate and even pass on to their kids traits that they picked up as kids. Some that they picked up from us are good, some they picked up maybe not so good. We never stop being mom and dad in all of this process, but we relate to them differently when they become adults. So so discipline, training, coaching, legacy. This is not a magic formula for parenting success. Children are born with a free will. You could be the best parent in the world and have kids that still make mistakes, that rebel, that just really fall off the rails. There are no guarantees, and, and you know that. But I think that these stages of parenting are helpful. And so over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about discipline, training, and coaching. From there, we're going to talk about releasing, about legacy, and then ultimately about how we honor our parents throughout life. Now, a couple of important things to mention, two common problems, I think, when you talk about stages of parenting. One is that some parents want to jump to the friendship stage before the kids are ready. And they abdicate all authority in favor of being the fun parent. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be fun. I'm not saying we can't have a great time spending time with our kids, doing fun things together, enjoying life together. It's just that we can't be just a pal to them. If we're not a parent, if we're not some kind of authority figure in their lives, I'm telling you, in their lives, we're asking for trouble. I mean, by all means, have fun with your kids. Laugh, play, enjoy life together. But when they are very young, you can't just be their friend. They're going to have plenty of friends, but they only have one mom and dad. It's important to not settle for just friendship. The other problem, I think, with stages like this is that some parents refuse to let their kids move on to the next stage. They want to treat their 10-year-old like he's 5, their teenage daughter like she's 11, their grown children like they're still in high school. As parents, we have to move through these stages of development or our kids are not going to become the adults that God's designed them to be. Somebody said the goal of parenting is to have a child and then work yourself out of a job. Now, you never stop being a parent, but ultimately we need to release our children to stand on their own two feet. And we're going to talk about that in the coming weeks. So today, I want us to dive into this whole subject of discipline. And again, the challenge is that we're at all such a different stages, right? I mean, some of you are like Gail and me, and and your kids are grown. Others of you have little ones at home, and and you're thinking the empty nest sounds pretty good about now. Uh, Maybe you've got teenagers, and you're still reeling from an argument that you had this morning that's not quite over yet. And you pulled into the parking lot and called a ceasefire, and it's going to pick up before lunch, you know? I, I read a verse the other day in the book of Revelation. And it's a very familiar verse. 
It's where Jesus says, look or behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. And that's a beautiful verse about how Jesus wants to be in a relationship with us. The interesting thing is what that verse follows. The previous verse is Revelation 3.19. Jesus says, I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. These two verses tell us that Jesus longs to be friends with us, but also that discipline is a part of our relationship. In fact, he says that discipline and correction spring from love. It's not a choice of love or discipline. As a parent, you can't have one without the other. Listen to this verse from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 in the New Testament. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Discipline is painful. It's no fun. But it is essential for right living. One of my favorite cartoons shows a dad talking to a mom. Dad's standing in the doorway. His son's on the bed, uh, back in the bedroom, and the, the mom is out in the living room. And the dad says, how am I supposed to spank him when he keeps saying, Lord God of Israel, have mercy on me? <laughs> you know, man, discipline is just hard. It's hard, but it is our responsibility. L- let me give you a bottom line, and then we're going to dig deeper, okay? Bottom line today is this. Godly boundaries are not oppressive they're liberating. Godly boundaries are not oppressive. They're liberating. Listen, parents, children need boundaries. It is not cruel or insensitive to set clear expectations and then expect them, demand that they meet them. Kids are not going to be perfect, of course, but without boundaries, we're setting them up for failure. We are not helping them be prepared for later on in life. And so we establish authority early. Listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. This is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. You honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will live a long life on the earth. Godly boundaries are not oppressive, they're liberating. When kids learn to submit to their parents, things will go better for them. They're more likely to enjoy a long life. Twice in the New Testament, book of James, uh, it says, it talks about God's perfect law that brings freedom. And that seems so contradictory. What do you mean laws that bring freedom? Seems like the absence of laws would bring freedom, but you know that's not true. It doesn't work that way. Rules of society, rules of morality, rules of behavior, we need those to live in a free society. Setting boundaries, offering clear and consistent guidelines, that's not oppressive for kids. It's liberating. It frees your child to discover life as God intended it to be lived. In fact, mom and dads, let me suggest this. We'll have a few of these along the way here. First thing is this. Be confident. God put you in charge. Okay, I'm telling you, God has delegated authority to parents. You are more capable than you probably feel like you are. I mean, I, I, I've heard parents say, man, I made so many mistakes when I was a child, when I was a teenager, when I was a young adult. I just don't feel qualified to be a parent. Well, friends, those experiences, even the bad decisions, the bad experiences, they have given you a level of wisdom that your kids don't yet have. Bad parents, listen, bad parents are not those who made bad decisions in the past. Go to that next slide if you would. Okay, bad parents are not those who made bad decisions in the past. They're the ones who never learn from their bad decisions. No matter what your growing up years were like, we have more wisdom from the experiences of life than our children do. And kids need the security of knowing that somebody's in charge. If we vacillate and remain indecisive, they're going to lack security. A friend of mine from years ago, I haven't talked to him in years, but, but he is a referee now for the NCAA, and I, he's been introduced uh, in some of these games during, the, during March Madness. See him on TV. Can you imagine a Final Four game where the referee negotiates with the players? 
You know, a defender from Purdue fouls a shooter from UConn, and the referee blows the whistle and says, how many times have I told you not to do that? And the Purdue guy says, do what? I didn't touch him. It was a clean block. And the UConn guy says, are you kidding me? You killed me. And the referee says, well, it's obvious we're getting nowhere here. Okay? I don't know who's at fault this time, but don't let it happen again. And pretty soon it happens again. And the ref says, you guys are driving me crazy. Don't make me count to three. I was like, what? I mean, the referee can't just say, well, you know, I just don't know what to do. These guys just are out of control. No, no, no. The referee has to take control or things get out of control. And it works the same in the home. Parents must take control. Every issue should not lead to a debate. Every instruction does not need to bring an argument. When, when we give an instruction, the normal response from most kids is not usually, I'd be glad to. What is it usually? Why? And almost always, that is not a request for information. Because if it were a request for an explanation, at least once in a while, the child would say, well, since you put it that way, I agree. That's a great idea. How reasonable you're being, Mom. No, no, no. Why is an invitation for an argument. When a child says why, you can do a couple of things. First of all, give a brief explanation, okay? If that's not enough, then you say, because I said so, I'm the parent, you're the child, God and I both expect you to do what I say, okay? We need to confidently take control because God said we're in charge. I'm telling you, if you don't do this early, man, fasten your seatbelt, it's going to be a tough ride. I have told some of you this, I've told this story so many times in the last 30 plus years, the day that will live in infamy in our family our older son, Aaron, who was a dad now and all that, he was about three years old. It was the day before Father's Day. He and I were getting ready to go to a father and son banquet. Gail was gone. I was in charge. And we had taught Aaron, young as he was, that when he burped, he needed to say, excuse me, no big deal. And he always did, except on this afternoon, he burped and he didn't say anything. I said, Aaron, what do you say? And he just looked at me. I said, Aaron, you need to say excuse me. And he said, uh-uh. Now, Aaron, you know you need to say excuse me. And he said, nope. And friends, that began, and I'm not exaggerating because I've told this story for 30 plus years and I have not upped the time, okay, I promise. Two hours and 20 minutes it took him to say excuse me. Two hours and 20 minutes. It was unbelievable. There were instructions there were some spankings on the bottom. There were some firm words. There were a lot of tears on both sides. I would hold him, comfort him, catch his breath. He would take a drink. I'd say, are you ready to say excuse me? He'd say, no. <laughs> I, am, I am not kidding you. Two hours and 20 minutes, and finally he put his head down and said, excuse me. I grabbed him, hugged him. We ran off to this event that we were an hour late for, and I'm the preacher. And some of you are out there thinking, Mark, you're an idiot. Why on earth would you do that? Oh, yeah? What if I waited until he was a teenager to have that little interaction? Friends, I'm telling you, it wasn't about winning and losing. It was about me winning and him losing. Because he had to know that he could not draw a line in the sand and I was going to back down. And you might disagree with that. I'm telling you, I think it was a defining moment in our family. We have a responsibility to teach children respect for authority. And man, if you don't do it when they're little, it just gets harder. Oh, our kids will be kids. Yep, yep. But we have to help them understand. See, this story kind of leads me to a principle that I want to share with you. Now, don't miss this. This is really important. It is easier to teach children respect for authority when they're little than to teach it to them when they're older. It is easier to start out strict and gradually loosen control than to start out lenient and then try to pull in the reins later on. When children are little, you have the opportunity to be vigilant and firm, not cruel, not harsh, but relentlessly attentive. Boundaries are tight, and it is exhausting. It is the hardest job, and you'll get so tired of being consistent. But if we do that when we're little, then later on, 
we can gradually give them independence. When Aaron, man, I'm glad he's not here, but when Aaron was like eight or nine years old, we gave some serious thought to giving him away. Uh, it, would have been to a, it would have been to a good home, okay? I mean, you know, we wouldn't have just let anybody have him. But seriously, he was driving me crazy. You know, I'm kidding. But man, he was driving me crazy. And I had people say to me, oh, just wait till he's a teenager. And I was worried sick. And then I decided, you know, I'm not going to set myself up for failure here and expect the worst. And so with prayer and, and some determination and, and some hard times, I'm telling you, things got so much better. By the time he was a teenager, because we were so persistent when he was young, and he about wore me out, he just flourished with independence. And he thrived as he got older. Now, I'm not saying this is a magic formula, okay? And I'm not saying I did it right all the time, by, not by any stretch. The best parents have kids often that, that rebel and turn away. I, I get all that. I'm just saying, maybe if you've been lax in your child rearing and you're struggling right now, maybe you've got a defiant teenager you don't know what to do with. Maybe you became a Christian later in life and the fact is you just really have not started very well with a good foundation. It is, don't, don't give up. It's not, it's not too late. If you have any kind of relationship at all with your kids today, no matter what age they are, you can begin to have a positive influence, but you got to work at it. And, and parents, the, the best way I think for children to live productive, godly lives is that we establish authority with them when they're young. Once it's established, then increasing freedom is their reward for compliance. All right, let me give you a, kind of a second thing here, and that's to be clear. All right, kids need well-defined boundaries. There's some common mistakes a lot of parents make. I know we made these mistakes. Sometimes we phrase our instructions as questions. Hey, how about picking up your toys before you go to bed? And a kid might be like, well, no thanks. <laughs> you know, or hey, don't you think it's about time to brush your teeth? No, not really. I, I don't think so. Then there's the classic, would you like a spanking? <laughs> you know, mom, I've given that some serious thought. I've decided no. No, not really. <laughs> Ixnay on the anking spay, okay? I just really don't want to go there at all. No, 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 it's not a choice. We give clear instructions. Sometimes we voice it as wishes. I wish you'd stop chomping that gum. I wish you'd put your phone away at the table. I wish you'd clean up your room. Kids don't grant wishes. Genies do, right? Kids need clear expectations. Don't be too vague. Now, don't be too wild at grandma's house. Well, if you're in preschool, that's a little a little vague you know maybe it needs to be look you don't stand up on the furniture we don't run inside the house we use our inside voice don't juggle grandma's crystal I mean you, know, you just got to say real specific things okay so be clear and then a third thing is to be consistent man discipline works best as a way of life l l let me kind of set this up for you children ought to be able to learn to expect consequences for their behavior if we just passively sit by and let them run crazy and, and be defiant and disobedient until we can't stand it anymore. And all of a sudden they do one little thing and we go ballistic. They're like, mom needs counseling. You know, this, something's not, not right here. Dad's out of control. Because we haven't been consistent. Ephesians 6, 4 says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. The New International Version says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Listen, discipline is not exasperating to kids. Inconsistency is. Discipline is more than just an occasional action. Well, I better whip them into shape because they've been out of control so long. It's a theme that runs throughout our parent-child relationship. Young children need established limits so they can understand boundaries. A friend of mine said the best parenting advice he ever heard uh, regarding discipline was first time every time. Now, I know that's not always going to happen, but, but what they taught their kids was first time every time. Kids are taught to obey for the first time. You don't need to count to three. All you're doing is teaching your child, I don't have to obey until two and a half. Okay? You can give them a heads up. Now, instead of saying, clean up right this minute, in five minutes, okay, we're going to start picking up. Or, or whatever it is. Give them a heads up, but you don't need to count. Because you're just teaching them, I don't have to obey yet. You don't have to get gra gradually louder and louder until the neighbors think you're talking to them. Okay, first time, every time. 
And man, parents, you got to be consistent together. When our kids were small, if Gail kind of set a limit and I did not enforce it, I was undermining her authority. And we disagreed sometimes over the rules, and we would talk about it, but we talked about it not in front of the kids. At least we tried to. <laughs> and I know with all the blended families today, you say, you know what, we, we've got expectations here, but when they go to our, the ex's house, you know, they do it all differently. And, and man, that's just hard. I, I'm sorry. It's just hard. But if you're two parents in the same house, or if you're a parent and a step-parent in the same house, you've got to support each other. As tiring as it is, you've got to be consistent with the rules and the expectations. When it comes to administering discipline, let me give you just some, some things to think about here. Okay, we'll, we'll try to get this wrapped up. I know some of you are dying, but just hang with me. Remember that the discipline needs to fit the, the violation, okay? But it also needs to fit the nature of the child. Some kids are very sensitive, and they just respond quickly to the slightest reprimand. Other kids, as you know, require a more rigid approach. And so our discipline needs to kind of work according to our child's personality. Our son Aaron, our daughter Mackenzie, when they were in preschool, early elementary years, they were so strong-willed they needed firm discipline. Our son Daniel in the middle was so compliant, I always said he didn't even count for parenting. Okay, I could just look at him crossways and he usually would shape right up. The other two almost needed a two-by-four upside the head to even know I was talking to them. And you know I didn't really do that, I'm just saying, not literally, but you know what I mean. So, so listen, if I corrected Daniel like I corrected them, I would have broken his heart. If I corrected them like I corrected Daniel, they would not have even noticed I was in the room <laughs> because their personalities are so different. Now, here's something else important. We punish deliberate, willful disobedience, not childhood mistakes. Children are going to stumble and fall sometimes. They're going to forget things sometimes. They're going to spill things. They're going to lose things. We do not punish children for acting their age. But willful defiance. Say, excuse me, uh uh. Okay, that's a whole different matter. And when we talk about discipline, please, please, please hear me. I am in no way advocating any kind of abusive behavior. It is horrible to mistreat a child. But we need clear boundaries and we need consequences. Godly boundaries are not oppressive, they're liberating. You know, when it comes to administering discipline to a really young child, maybe isolation, right? A child throws a temper tantrum, kicks and screams and holds his breath. If you give in to that, you have just taught him, I know how to get my way. And he will get his or her way every time by pulling that same behavior. Instead of surrendering, physically pick the child up, take him to his room, make sure he's not having too good of a time in there, make sure he realizes that isolation is the result of throwing a fit. And so time out. Maybe a child is touching something he's not supposed to, he's you know, being rough with another, another child. We found when our kids were really little, just hold both of their little hands in yours, and they don't like that very much. And it kind of became a, if you're going to keep doing what you're not supposed to, we're going to kind of not let that keep happening. And, and, and that was not a comfortable thing. As kids get older, I know this doesn't always work, but removing privileges often gets their attention, restricting activities, limiting friend time, screen time, taking away their phone when they're older. Okay, practical responses to defiant behavior and look man I'm, I'm swallowing hard I'm getting sweaty just thinking about this but I just want to say this as children move out of the toddler years into preschool time some parents find that a spanking on the bottom is an important part of discipline I know it's controversial and you may not agree and that's okay you handle that the way you think is right I'm never talking about ever talking about abusive behavior at all I'm saying physical discomfort can help modify behavior. If you disagree, that's okay, but I'm telling you, I've been down this road with strong-willed children. Now, when it comes to spanking, I'm talking about a swat on the bottom. I mean, you never hit a child. You never, you know, punch a child. Lord knows. I don't think you should slap a child in the face. It's demeaning, and it's almost always done in anger. Spanking is a last resort when willful disobedience is being displayed. The more upset we are, we need to back away from the situation, put them in time out, maybe, you know, deal with things when emotions are under control. I've heard people recommend, kind of experts recommend, that you not use your hand to spank a child. Hands are for loving and offering comfort. We had, okay, 
We had a spanking spoon when our kids were little, more of a spatula kind of thing. And they laugh about it now. They joke about the spanking spoon. But I can tell you back then it was not their favorite culinary instrument in the kitchen. Okay. I recommend that you don't discipline kids in public. It can be humiliating for a child. Any lesson you're trying to teach them is going to be missed in the misery of being embarrassed. And always, always, always demonstrate affection after discipline. Okay, don't leave the room mad. A child needs to know that you love him or her. You might be disappointed in their behavior, but a hug and a kiss are an important part of this process. Look, the key, listen. The key is to establish control early. Child psychologist Brenda Hunter said, remember that the wild two-year-old, if undisciplined, will become the surly six-year-old. And if that child is untamed, he may become the uncontrolled teenager who breaks your heart. So take charge early. And friends, the ultimate goal of all of this, I hope you know, is that children learn to surrender, to respect the authority of God. That they learn to submit to their parents' authority because that begins the process of them submitting to God's authority. And nothing is more important than that. Look, I know this this is a hard topic. Some of you are grieving today because of mistakes you made in the past. Others of you are scared to death because of the responsibility that's staring you in the face right now. If you're not a perfect parent or you weren't, man, get in line. If you don't have perfect kids, join the club. If you regret things about the past, I mean, you know, welcome to the human race. None of us are perfect parents, and none of us have been perfect children. And we as parents, we have an opportunity, we have a responsibility given to us by God to shape the next generation. And and with the help of the church family, we we do that. We set boundaries. We, We help them grow to become who they need to be. All right, I'll wrap up with this. Back in 2007, our our family went to the Grand Canyon. And man, we had such a great trip. It was just, it was beautiful, just indescribable. But I found, no kidding, I could hardly stand to be at the rim of the canyon when other families were around. There were parents who were letting their kids wander right up to the edge. In many places, there's no rails at all. People would would turn their backs on the canyon, have somebody taking their picture, and they just keep backing up to get just the right shot. I'm thinking, do you guys not know people die here every year? I don't want to see that on vacation, you know? I mean, I would just, I was a basket case at times. But as hard as that was to watch, I still would not have missed that trip for the world because it was just spectacular. It just reinforced to me the importance of boundaries. And friends, I wouldn't have missed being a dad for the world. I'm just reminded more and more of how important boundaries are. Okay, godly boundaries are not oppressive. They're liberating. And that goes not just for us, for our kids, but it goes for us. Right, that God has boundaries for us too. And they're not oppressive. They're liberating. Let's pray. God, we talked about a lot today and got a lot more we're going to dive into. And I just pray for wisdom. I pray, Lord, that for for people who have little little children and they're navigating next steps, I pray that you just give them strength, give them peace, give them the ability to, to be consistent when they're exhausted and all that. For those of us who largely have parenting uh, behind us, Help us to know how to to be a positive influence to our grown kids and our grandkids and just all that's ahead. And and, and for for teenagers and kids in the room today, I I know it's impossible probably for them to to grasp completely, but man, it's hard being a parent. It, It just is. And if we could all just learn to show each other a little more grace, how much better life would be. Lord Jesus, that, that you have paid the price for our sins and Father that you have adopted us as your children just reminds us of how important family is help us to live lives that bring you honor and thank you for your grace in Jesus name Amen